and this plot falls into his lap. And so he starts to, to do his job to save the world, prevent the war from occurring. And, and he's, he's working against German spies, but they're not the ones thwarting his effort. It's the British people. It's the, it's the policemen up in Scotland, and it's the good people he stays with in their home. And they're good people. Again, they have no animus, but they try, they end up thwarting the uh, spies' efforts. So with that sort of theoretical background, I'm going to introduce what I think is the new meddler, uh, and that is Congress. In the paper, which I have and which we all have pre will have and we hope will be published someday, I have a section now that um, go runs over the development of congressional oversight of intelligence in American history. I won't touch that at all here. I'll just say that it began fundamentally in 1975, blossomed in 1976, 77, 78. Uh, so I looked at novels written after that after 1975. And I had the great good fortune of having a group of students who were willing to help me. We looked at over 200 novels, all gathered from, from uh, Jack Smith's great book, uh, Cloak and Dagger Bibliography. Uh, and almost every one we could get a hold of, some of them were, were, uh, were rightfully unattain unattainable, out of print, and we hope given a good funeral and never to be resurrected. Uh, <laughs> But nearly every other one we got hold of, and students read them, and I read them, and we had just a lot of fun. So I think, nearly as we could tell, the first mention of congressional oversight of intelligence that occurred post-1975, when congressional oversight began, was in Robert Ludlum's novel, The Parsifal Mosaic, published in 1982, six years after the Senate committee was created. Uh, Ludlum overdoes his plots, very complicated, and certainly would never go down in history as a great novelist, but very popular, widely read novelist. In the Parsifal Mosaic, he has a meeting that's going on at CIA headquarters, senior officials. In this discussion, that includes, interestingly enough, a psychoanalyst and the attorney Dolly's referred to as the attorney, I assume maybe the CIA chief legal counsel. One participant in this discussion says, I think the point Dawson's making is that this is no time for a Senate inquiry or the hanging judges of a congressional oversight committee. They could tie our hands far more effectively than any mob from the pink radical cheek or the wheat German granola crowd. <laughs> Now, if this is, uh, as I think, the first reference to congressional oversight, it, it has amazing staying power. Uh, it appears in this first reference in Ludlam down through virtually the latest book written in which it is mentioned, and that's the tone that's taken, that Congress is the problem. Congress is the enemy. It's the meddler. Uh, and Ludlam if nothing else, is very dogged in sticking to this theme. In the Apocalypse Watch novel published in 1995, Ludlam has a special officer for consular operations. I'm not certain that's an office that actually exists, but no matter. He tells the Secretary of State that he needs authority to conduct a very special domestic operation. The Secretary of State says, no problem, you've got it, I approve. Another person in the meeting says, just a minute, Mr. Secretary, uh, this is a domestic operation. It might need congressional approval. To this, the Secretary of State, not certain that he can obtain this congressional approval, replies, screw the Congress. Just keep it quiet. Good Lord, you can at least do that, can't you? You're both part of the administration, aren't you? It's called the executive branch, gentlemen. And if the executive, the presidency itself, can root out the Nazi influence in this country, the nation will be forever thankful. Theme that is repeated over and over. If we can just get Congress off our backs, we can save this nation. Uh, in Ludlam's um, uh, 
Maltery's Countdown, 1997, he repeats this theme. Here he has a case officer, Beowulf, Beowulf Agate is his name. I don't know where he got that name from. Uh, this case officer explains to the um, uh, DDI, uh, DD, to the uh, Deputy Director of Intelligence, of C Central Intelligence, that the agency could be much more effective if it were just allowed to play dirty. Down and dirty. Down and dirty, Mr. Deputy Director, replies Beowulf Agate. No hearings, no courts, no congressional interference from either the House or the Senate. Just down and dirty, way down and dirty. We get the names, the regions, the corporations. We learn who the Medusa is, the cranial temple that produces the snakes, and when we cut their heads off one by one. We could do this, you see, if it just weren't for Congress. Um, Ludlam is not alone in this. A surprising character joins uh, suit here, um, Alan Drury. Alan Drury wrote, uh, he's often called the father of congressional literature. Uh, when, when Drury wrote um, his Pulitzer Prize winning novel in 1959 called Advice and Consent, it was only the third novel in American history in which Congress was featured as a central um, as a central element. Uh, Mark Twain's The Gilded Age was the first one, Henry Adams' Democracy was the second one, and Alan Drury's Advice and Consent was the third. And, and one of the great effects of Advice and Consent is it made the United States readers interested in Congress as a, as, as a, as a character in, in novels. Um, so what happens in Alan Drury? Well, he never talks about congressional oversight of intelligence. He has a lot to say about congressional oversight of military. In a book called Pentagon, you know what that is about, he repeats this theme, Congress of Meddler, as Meddler, many, many times, over and over. And it surprised me because often journalists or scholars who study Congress or hang out at Congress develop a little sympathy for it. But uh, Drury did not. He remains uh, in his 1996 novel called A Thing of State. Um, no, excuse me, let me go back to the Pentagon, his, his book called Pentagon. He has a crisis erupting in um, Nanakuvu. Ted knows where that is. Uh, the Secretary of Defense is lunching with five members of Congress in the Joint Chiefs of Staff dining room. And uh, this is what he says. His guests were the military. Military's principal problems on the Hill. They, there were other senators and congressmen and other staff members who were difficult, but these were the five who gave the Defense Department the most consistent hell. And that, by inference, carries over to intelligence as well, but Drury really, really develops it in terms of, uh, of the military. In his 1996 book, A Thing of State, he describes a Secretary of State as a person who was generally considered in the department to be an excellent choice for dealing with what most department employees regarded as the major bane of their existence, namely the Congress of the United States, those windy, illegitimate people, those interfering, illegitimate people, those illegitimate people. <laughs> but I have to get to the creme de la creme quickly here. Uh, no writer in spy fiction has ever shown as much disdain for Congress, as does Vince Flynn, uh, the author of the popular and violent Mitch Rabb series. Uh, the absence of any critical uh, acclaim here has not stopped several of his books from becoming bestsellers. In, in these books, the hero Mitch Rabb is going to be called nothing else but an assassin for the CIA. And over his career, he saves the lives of of many, many people. In one of the books, he saves the lives of the President of the United States. Not a bad life to save if you're trying to build up some chits, it seems to me. Uh, but a lot of people have become great fans of Mitch Rabb, even though he can't sneeze without breaking the law. Um, in his 2003 novel, Executive Powers, an, an aptly named book, by the way, the theme emerges in the prelude to the chapter to the book when Flynn has a character say that a member of the House 
Intelligence Committee, has just leaked important information to the press in an attempt to hurt the reputation of a newly appointed DCI, Irene Kennedy. Kennedy believes that congressional oversight has created a CIA that is afraid to take risks. Even the director of the agency's counterterrorism center gets into the act. He explains that after 9-11, he was forced into hiring six additional staff members whose sole dirty duties were to keep Congress happy. In his 2005 novel, Consent to Kill, which is about the sixth book in the, in the uh, Mitch Rabb uh, Rab, uh, series, Flynn's animosity towards Congress really reaches its highest, highest point. Uh, Flynn, after assassinating a terrorist in Montreal, Canada, I'm sure with permission of the Canadian government, uh, <laughs> he, uh, he, and he does it without the knowledge of the president and without the approval of the DCI. But when he returns, the DCI gives her post hoc approval to it. But <laughs> Rab is meeting, the CIA said, is, assassin is meeting with Senator Bill Walsh, the chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, and another senator who is not, whose role is not identified. And this dialogue he has with them reveals Rab's and Flynn's utter disdain, utter dislike for Congress. Uh, it, it also reflects Flynn's fairly careful awareness of the uh, 2004 Intelligence Reform and uh, Terrorist Prevention Act. Um, Flynn has obviously talked to members of the IC, uh, Larry, because he's picked up some attitudes here that I know I've heard you uh, share a little bit. Uh, Senator Walsh begins the conversation. He says, talking to Rab, he says, we're concerned, Mitch, concerned that with all this rhetoric, with the expansion of Homeland Security, with the new Director of National Intelligence, that we're not doing enough to protect America. Rab, unsurprisingly, agrees with him. Senator Walsh asks Rab what he thinks of the post-9-11 intelligence organization. This, of course, gives Rab a wonderful opportunity to vent his spleen, uh, which he does. Rab's, uh, Rab, it says in the book, doubting that they would ever get an honest answer from anyone else on this question, Rab says, I think it's a misguided, ill-conceived overreaction brought on by a bunch of politicians who are in a hurry to act like they're doing something, anything, so that when the next attack comes, they can say they did everything in their power to stop it. When in reality, all they did was get in the way of the people who were really defending the country. Then Rab accuses the two parties of having spent so much time, time, time trying to embarrass each other over the past two decades that they've turned the CIA into an inefficient, money-sucking Washington bureaucracy. Then Senator Hoffs, um, uh, Hartsburg scoffs at this, and I love this next exchange. He says, uh, it's not easy representing the people. And to that, Rab says, easy doesn't factor into this for me at all, Senator. I'm talking about right and wrong. Interesting comment from a man uh, for whom the phrase due process is an alien concept. <laughs> a little later in the conversation, after lamenting the deaths of so many people in the 9-11 attacks, Rab excitedly and sarcastically asked, to the two senators. You think they died because we didn't have a director of national intelligence? I thought Larry would like that. It's a sentiment I've heard expressed before, and in another sentiment I've heard expressed in Washington, Rab drives this point home. He says to the senators, if you want to legislate social change, talk to the Department of Education or the Department of Health and Human Services, but don't mess around with Langley. <laughs> Near the end of the conversation, the senators make a fatal mistake, and they ask Rab what he would do if he were in charge of the CIA. And this is what he says. Well, it's not very complicated. You've got top-heavy bureaucracy over there, an inverted pyramid. Less than 1% of the people on the payroll do real work. Heck, before 9-11, you had more people working in the Office of Diversity than you had on the bin Laden desk. Later in the book, uh, Rab has an interesting uh, reflection. He reflects back on the previous DCI, the fictional previous DCI, whom he really admired. His name was Thomas Stanfield. 
<laughs> that makes some of you laugh, and I'll tell you why. But let me show you. Uh, this is what he says about Stansfield. He said, what Stansfield feared were the opportunists on Capitol Hill. The politicians who eagerly awaited any chance to take the stage and act out another drama, they were the real enemies. I've only called them meddlers. They were the real enemies, the enemy from within, men who could ruin your career and reputation with one theatrical soundbite. <laughs> the choice of the name Thomas Stansfield as a previous DCI whom Rab admires is quite interesting to me. I, I don't I don't see how he could be patterning it after the real DCI during the Car Carter administration, Admiral Stansfield Turner, but the name familiar, it's a similarity, is just took not too much, it seems to me. Uh, Admiral Turner uh, didn't like Congress, we, we would all agree with that, but, but Turner didn't like black operations either <laughs> and uh, fired a lot of the people, so uh, I don't know why he chose that name. One of the themes that uh, comes up in these novels a lot, oh, over and over, is that the solution to the entire problem is to leave the CIA and the intelligence community as it is, but instead create a super secret, a hidden, a black agency inside the bowels of the government some way that can, now can do its work without any kind of oversight. That comes up over and over. It comes up in some novels by some actually much better writers than Ludlum and Vince Flynn. It comes up in uh, Joseph Finder's The Moscow Club. Not a bad book, actually. But Finder writes that the church committee, oh no, let me skip one earlier, one earlier here. Uh, Finder writes that the president, the DCI record recommended to the president that there be created an ostensibly private funded unit to be established and separated from its parent organizations. And then the DCI remarks, it's an imperfect solution. But in an untidy world, the director had said, even an accommodation like this was more appropriate for a secret intelligence organization than the comfort of official status and the suffocating embrace of the civil world. <laughs> Joseph Finder writes in the, the, the Moscow Club, talking about another secret organization that had been created called the American Flag Foundation. Joseph Finder writes, it is a common place within certain elements of this and other intelligence agencies that however such proscriptions as banning the CIA from domestic operations are foolish vestiges of noble democratic sentiment, intelligence cannot function when it is handicapped by such rules. Well, I won't go through the rest of the spy novels that pick up this theme of a super secret black organization, but there are many of them. Even Robert Littell, whom I, I, I quite enjoy Littell's writing in his monumental book, uh, The Company, he recounts a conversation between Jack, a, a, a DO case officer who's grown up in the agency and become very senior, and Ebby, his best friend that grew up in the agency with him and is now DCI. And uh, uh, Jack proposes to his friend Ebby that the, along with the help of uh, the Mossad and some large amounts of Soviet money that he thinks he knows how to get, they create a super secret agency to work in the shadows because it would not be subject to congressional oversight. Well, I was quite shocked to find ultimately only two authors that said anything decent about congressional oversight, anything decent at all. One group of authors, one author, or two authors actually, will not surprise you. Uh, one of them was former, is former Senator Gary Hart, a member of the church committee and a member of the Senate committee. And uh, in the second book he did, he did it with former Senator uh, uh, Cohen. What's his name? Uh, Bill Cohen who was a member of the Senate Intelligence Committee, not the Church Committee, but also Secretary of Defense in the Clinton administration. Uh, these people write very favorably of congressional <laughs> oversight. Does that surprise you? Uh, in one scene, they write in their first book called The Double Man, they write, DCI Trevor had been summoned once again to testify before the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. He was not happy about it. In truth, he resented the very existence of the committee 
which had been established in 1974, he writes, <laughs> both those senators knew better than that, it was established in 1976, but to oversee congressional, uh, the activities of the CIA. Well, that's not a surprising thing to write. Ted and I both remember very well the first time Admiral Turner was summoned to the hearing room, which these authors described very well. They describe it just the way it was, Ted. They invited Admiral Turner to give one of his first reports, a command appearance to this committee. And Ted and I were in the room, four or five other staff people. <coughs> Pardon? Yeah, Fritz might have been there. Did you walk in with him that time? I uh, and, uh, and the first thing Admiral Turner did, he looked around and he looked at Ted and I and the other staff members and said, who are all these gawkers? <laughs> Clear them. So we all got out, even though we had clearances to be there, but we all got out and later it was worked out and we got back in. But I remember that very well in the, his body language. Coming before the Senate committee, you would have thought he was appearing before the KGB. It was, he was really unhappy, I think, Fred. <laughs> Fred. Later in the novel, one of the characters, uh, talking uh, Senator Chandler, who's the hero in this thing, says, uh, the agency's covert authority has been too severely, too sharply restricted. Only spy novel I've ever read, where immediately following a statement like that, there are no grunts of approval, no cheers of hurrah, no hip hip hooray. Here he meets with disdain when he says that. Uh, Hart and Cohen, I think, reflect the suspicions they developed while serving the Senate committee in several passages from the book. One place they have DCI Trevor reflecting that he, quote, was not about to share that information with the Intelligence Committee if he could possibly avoid it. Later in the novel, the same DCI reflects, the Intelligence Committee was presumed to have unlimited access to a glamorous world of mystery and intrigue. In actuality, committee members were admitted only to the periphery of that world. Testimony about CIA activities came to the committee sanitized, wrapped in vague generalities. Members of the Intelligence Committee knew only as much as the agency chose to disclose to them. That's a sentiment you don't get in any other spy novel. Let me quickly jump, though, to my last book. Uh, this is by, this is by these series of books by the famous spy writer Tom Clancy. He treats oversight as quite positive. Um, at times he treats it as necessary. Um, none of his novels show this utter and recurring disdain that present in every one. And I want to just pick on one novel, Clear and Present Danger. You all know that story, the American president's attempt to uh, combat drug running for South America. It was a bestseller when it was published in 1989, made into a major motion picture in 1994 by Paramount, starring, of course, Harrison Ford. And as usual, Hollywood changed the story dramatically, but in the book, um, Jack Ryan, of course, is, uh, is asked to become acting deputy director of intelligence. The deputy director, Admiral Greer, is ill, and Ryan is appointed. In that capacity, he learns of a CIA activity in Colombia to interdict drug trades, and it concerns him. It turns out later on to be illegal. It turns out not to have been reported to the appropriate congressional committees. Ryan is a fascinating character. Um, analysts who work for the real world CIA, um, they tend to both chuckle, but sometimes uh, envy. Jack Ryan. I mean, in how many spy novels is an analyst out running around as an operator? Uh, so I say they chuckle at him. Uh, case officers, officers who read the novel, they chuckle at him also, but for a different reason. Uh, throughout this novel, uh, Ryan, uh, Clancy speaks very favorably about oversight. Uh, on, on the other hand, um, the president and the National Security Affairs Advisor are very disdainful of it. It's kind of a reversal of the of the usual pattern. Um, in one scene, uh, the nationals, the, um, they're talking about the secret operation in Columbia, the DCI is, and he chuckles, he says, we have to keep it all so secret, don't we? Uh, and uh, Cutter, the National Security Affairs Advisor, points out that the DCI has not told Congress about the operation yet. And then the president forcefully declares, they don't find out. If we tell them, it'll leak sure as hell. 
you tell more and Ritter that. So that's, uh, that's the attitude here, and uh, it, it, it's, it's quite consistent throughout this attitude. In the book, a wonderful scene that's not in the movie, Ryan is briefing a presidential candidate, as the CIA really does. They brief presidential candidates uh, out of courtesy to get them up to speed. And uh, Ryan tells him about uh, uh, an appropriately made decision with a presidential finding, Larry, that authorized the killing of a, someone. And Ryan says, if that happens, it is not murder. And the candidate asks for an explanation. How can it not be murder? And this is what Ryan tells him. Because of the way our government works, such decisions have to be made. They have to reflect the way the American people want things to be, or would want them to be if they had knowledge available to the people who make the decisions. That's why we have congressional oversight of covert operations, both to ensure that the operations are appropriate and to depoliticize them. The closing scene of the novel, you'll recall, uh, Ryan goes to the president uh, and he takes the chairman, two people from the House Intelligence Committee with him. They wait outside the room, but he takes them with him. That doesn't, he doesn't do that in the movie. But uh, he brought them there. One of them is a gay New, New, New Englander. The other he calls a tough-minded Mormon from Arizona. <laughs> he takes them to the Oval Office. And in the novel, it's the presence of those two men who seem to now indicate that everything is going to end right. Congress is stepping in here, and, and things are going to work out now. It's a, it's a wonderful ending in the book. In the movie version, it's a little different. Uh, you know in the movie that Ryan goes before this uh, committee, uh, the Senate committee, in the, in the book they switch it to the Senate. But in, in, the, in the movie they switch it to the Senate. And in the movie he goes before this Senate committee and he, he is asked some questions. And I think we've got a fin film clip here that will show this very briefly. I want to thank you, Dr. Ryan, for the information you've shared with us this afternoon. Thank you, Senator. I agree we have to help the Colombians in their struggle to curtail the drug cartel's activities. However, I'm confused. How do you see additional funds alone advancing this program from the utter failure that it is? You see what I'm getting at? No, I'm afraid I don't. You said this effort would be totally benign on our part. Well, the finding clearly states that our assistance is limited to supply and advice only, Senator. I know I've read that. I've also read a similar finding written 35 years ago this week regarding a little thought of sliver of jungle in Southeast Asia. Uh, I'm sorry, you're, you're comparing our request for supplemental anti-drug funds to Vietnam? I'm comparing it to every instance a legislative body such as this is asked to render judgment based on less than all the facts. Well, I'm afraid I don't know what to say to that. Uh, you could begin by assuring us we have been given all the facts. I thought I had. You could further assure us, then, that this increase in funds, this escalation, to use your word, will not be used for any covert military action. I, I don't know how you're getting to this. Long experience, <laughs> sir. No troops, then. I enunciate that clearly because I don't want there to be any mistake. No troops. You could say I have your word on that. You could indeed because you do. As you remember, now through the movie, that turns out to have been a lie. Not that he's lying to them, but he didn't know about the covert actions going on in in Colombia, and much of the action of the movie now takes place, and he goes down in himself. <laughs> and, uh, but I love the way this movie ends, because uh, you remember now he confronts the president in this great conclusion to the movie, and, and uh, he says, uh, when he meets the president, uh, dramatic scene, the president points out that Ryan lied to Congress and therefore he's culpable now as well. And uh, then the, uh, Ryan still refuses to go along with the cover-up and so the president says, well look, you're culpable and, but you go along and then I owe you. 
I owe you, and, and my debt to you will protect you for the rest of your career. As long as I'm president, you'll get ahead. And uh, the president calls this the Potomac two-step. And you remember Ryan says, sorry, Mr. President, I don't dance. <laughs> and then the final scene, after this dramatic confrontation with the president, what's going to make everything right? What's going to solve this problem? What's going to save the nation? Let's have the next clip here. He goes to the White House again. The committee will please come to order. He goes to the Senate. The chair will now call Dr. John Ryan. Dr. Ryan, thank you very much for appearing before the committee today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give before this committee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. And with that, Dr. Ryan, you may consider yourself on the road. Please be seated. The world is safe, isn't it? <laughs> and the Senate plays a major role in that. I had to show you this, uh, even though, as you know, it's the only book I could find it in. The only movie or anything I could ever find where congressional oversight is presented in any sort of favorable light. So the conclusion of my little research here, helped greatly by my students, uh, the great majority of spy writers do not like congressional oversight. <laughs> uh, Congress is the meddler. But it also helps develop, in the minds of the readers, greater sympathy for the spies, the employees of the intelligence agencies. I found only two writers who broke, uh, broke ranks and wrote of Congress in a favorable light. It's been somewhat surprising to me to find so many current and former intelligence employees who can point out dozens, hundreds of factual errors in any spy no movie or any spy novel, but who nevertheless think that these novels are spot on in their depiction of Congress, the damaging effects of congressional oversight. They tend to suspend their skepticism about the veracity of spy fiction as long as the writers will pick on Congress. <laughs> My view is a little different. I don't know if I have time to explain it. Uh, I don't think Congress is the meddler, nor do I think it's the savior. Uh, I think it performed a valuable role in its early days, particularly. I think the, some of the intelligence community was on its way to self-destruction, uh, in fact, had, had it not occurred. And I was talking to Ted at lunch about a m meeting that he and I, uh, as I recall, were both uh, at, with uh, Admiral Bobby Inman when he was director of NSA. And uh, Bob Admiral Inman said, um, he told us about a meeting that had been held a year or two earlier, I'd guess maybe 74, maybe, with all the directors of the other intelligence agencies. He said they had gotten together to see what they could come up with that would prevent the development of congressional intelligence. And Admiral Inman said, I suggested to them that that was a mistake for two reasons. I suggested to them that this was inevitable. <laughs> we ought not to fight what's inevitable. Number two, he said, as I recall it, we need a friend on the Hill. Every other federal bureaucracy has a committee on Congress that protects it. Ted recalls that he also said, and anyway, once they all get cleared, we can co-opt them, and they'll be ours. So I don't know whether that happened, uh, but um, Ted and I both remember uh, Senator Joe Biden. Before the committee was created, during the church committee hearings, no senator smoke, spoke more critically of the CIA. He gave vitriolic talks on the floor of the Senate against the CIA, and he was put on the first Senate Intelligence Committee. And within six months, I heard him stand up in the Senate and give a sterling defense of the CIA. Some would say co-option. Others would say he just now learned what was really going on. 
But in any event, my view is that Congress can and has played an important role. If we had time, I'd tell you about the development of the FISA Act, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. We worked on that for about a, a year and a half, almost a two-year period. And through that entire period, we met weekly, sometimes multiple times a week, with CIA people, and then we'd go meet with ACLU people. And we kept meeting between them till we got an agreement that both said they could accept. We, we literally carried agency water for, us, for them in bringing about this act that they wanted and we thought they needed, and we got it worded in a way that made it uh, somewhat acceptable. So uh, my conclusion, Congress is neither the meddler nor the savior. As uh, many have pointed out, Congress, the intelligence committees of Congress have changed a great deal since those early days. They've become significantly partisanized, polarized. And the early days, there was much more of a, a unitary, a bipartisan spirit in them. And, uh, and Ted and I know who brought that about. Uh, his name was, well, I won't tell you his name, but. So anyway, that's my presentation, and uh, we'll now ask the panel to come up, and then we'll take some comments. That be okay? I'd just like to make an observation, since I seem to be so close to the microphone, <laughs> of, one, uh, of one instance where, counterintuitively, the involvement in the Congress in clandestine operations was applauded by the people who were considered to be the most uh, constrained by it, and that's the Hughes-Ryan Amendment. When Hughes-Ryan went through, one would have thought that the attitude in CIA would be, oh my goodness, 12 committees of the Congress. Well, we didn't, Larry, I don't think we, we, we like the notion of all the numbers of committees that uh, before the Intelligence Oversight Committees were created, we had to report to. But to have uh, a different to have a requirement of a presidential finding which went to the oversight committees and made it clear that as you, your uh, church committee investigation had shown, CIA was not in fact a rogue elephant. It was not running out and uh, assassinating world leaders on its own hook. But I would say in the directorate of operations, those who understood the mechanics at all said, amen. We're not going to be doing any more of these operations without a presidential finding, which has to be briefed at some point to the oversight committees. Excellent. So we're not authors, but we're <laughs> somewhat important. You haven't been in introduced yet to uh, Frederick Hitz. Uh, Fred Hitz was uh, in the CIA for many years, CIA for many years, spent his last eight or nine years, eight years, as inspector general, the first presidentially appointed Inspector General of the CIA. And uh, Fred is very familiar with all of the things that we've been talking about here today. And he, could, he, taught, he had to teach his class at the University of Virginia. Couldn't get here for yesterday's sessions. But we're glad you're here now, Fred. Panel, please, grab those mics out. It works better if you just pull it out. Yeah, pass it around. Do you want to start? Well, there's so much that uh, has been covered in the two talks, it's hard to you know, know where to begin. I guess um, the absurd might be the best place to begin. Um, <laughs> then go to the ridiculous. <laughs> Wes Wark's presentation finally cleared up for me the providence of Prince Charles. Um, I've never been able to figure out how Prince Philip could be his father. Now it's clear that it was William F. Buckler. <laughs> I guess the other thing that I thought was intriguing about the, and again, a little bit absurd, I suppose, but is the notion that all of the agents who are presented as heroes through the, the two examples that Professor Wark presented and others in fiction and have all tended to be macho, right wing, uh, pretty much, you know, let's, let's not mess around with any of these gray areas, everything's got to be black and white. I can't possibly imagine, or, or maybe somebody can correct, with the possible exception of Austin Powers, an ACLU belonging, uh, anti, uh, you know, uh, or pro-feminist, um, <laughs> you know, sort of Volkswagen driving uh, <laughs> secret agent appearing in fiction. 
Uh, so if, if somebody can, uh, yes, a radical sheet granola eating uh, secret agent. So if you can, somebody can provide that to me, I'd love to read the novel that <laughs> features that character. Um, on stands, since I you know, participated in a lot of the events, um, I guess I think meddling is not a bad word because I think that's the way checks and balances work. Checks and balances, if they were going to be really neat and simple and everything, wouldn't be worth having. So if there's not a little bit of, uh, you know, blood and guts and, and tr you know, uh, strife that goes on in uh, sort of doing this job uh, of maintaining our democracy, you know, I think uh, it's probably not worth doing. So uh, I, don't, I don't object to meddling uh, when it shows up in these. Um, Again, though, it would have been nice if Gary Hart and Bill Cohen had had a, uh, you know, heroic, you know, senator uh, as a, a secret agent, but uh, would, I think that would have been stretching credulity too much. <laughs> uh, thanks, Ted. Uh, Larry? Well, I'll keep my marks rather cryptic. You can all take me on after if you'd like. Uh, in Mr. Warwick's pr presentation, I enjoyed it. It was, it was really thought-provoking. Unfortunately, he lost me when he got to who's on first, because the only fir who's on first that I know of is Abbott and Costello. But then I started to think about it, and quite frankly, uh, that's what a lot of those spy novels at Howard Hunt were like. Uh, who's on first? If you could follow him around the base path, you were lucky. And that's kind of where I came down on Howard. I'm not a great fan of him. Uh, Buckley, uh, I watched him occasionally, but he never inspired me. Uh, he kind of reminded me of the Great Gadsby uh, movie. Uh, he belonged to kind of that social elite upper crust on the East Coast, and he never quite could reach out to us poor folks who were shoveling crap out in the, m in the barnyard and keeping ditch banks to keep the crops growing. Uh, so I, I, I understand them, but I don't, I guess. Uh, on Stan's remarks, I only have a couple of comments. I think senator and a hero in today's word is an oxymoron. Uh, the problem in my opinion with the committees was not that they were formed, it's what they became. Uh, unfortunately, as we have gone through the last uh, three decades in Washington, the committees have morphed from what they were intended to be. Uh, one of the reasons I left the agency in 1997 was quite frankly I'd had a belly full of 24 year olds coming over to tell me how to run operations in countries to which they had never been in and didn't know a damn thing about. And I finally just said enough's enough. Uh, I got another life I can go live and I just said say la vie and, and went out the door. The committee oversight is only as valuable as the knowledge of the committee staffs. And in many instances they were not interested in being taught they were not teachable. Uh, I hear that that's turned around somewhat in the last few years, but I really am skeptical of that belief. They did become meddlers in the worst sense. I know that's not what they were intended to be. With regard to the Intelligence Reform and Terrorist Prevention Act of December of 2004, in my opinion, it classifies as the worst piece of legislation ever produced by the United States government. Uh, you could have done nothing worse to the national intelligence establishment and the intelligence community than what happened in that act. We created another bureaucracy, which is totally unfunctional. The senators and the congressmen did not address the root issues that had been debated and of which there were over 20 five committees held on trying to figure out how to solve the dilemma of how do you run the intelligence community uh, from a DCI or NDI position. They created the position and left it as weak and in my opinion even weaker than it was when it was held jointly by the DCI and the DCIA. Uh, I think that's going to have to be revisited. It will probably take a severe crisis to the country before that happens, unfortunately. Thanks very much, Larry. Let me just add, before you move on, that the great tragedy of that whole event that you're speaking of, the creation of this act, in my judgment, was that the greatest influence on Congress and on the presidency 
in passing and pushing for that act came from a group of people for whom we have to have much sympathy, the survivors of the 9-11 group, but people who have no knowledge or expertise at all of the intelligence process, and they are the group that almost single-handedly got that act through Congress. Mark? Also, a lot of things to comment on here. Okay. Uh, well, let me start with the last presentation first, since that's, that's fresh on the mind here. Uh, with respect to uh, uh, actually the IRTPA uh, that was passed in December of uh, 2004, uh, spurred by uh, recommendations from the 9-11 Commission. One of the recommendations, uh, significant recommendations, is uh, Congress heal thyself, because there are so many committees that have oversight, jurisdiction, interest in. Um, and uh, when the Democrats took power in the most recent Congress, they quickly backtracked after their promise of enacting all those recommendations because that was something too hard to do. It's one thing uh, for all of the uh, committees of Congress uh, that uh, senior members of the intelligence community have to uh, testify before, but they should count their blessings. They're not the Secretary of Homeland Security, where there are 80 committees, 88 committees and subcommittees that that poor individual has to, to deal with. Um, when we talk about Congress being a friend of intelligence, Sometimes it is, sometimes it is not. A lot of times critics will say, well, if there's agreement there, obviously they've been co-opted. If there's disagreement, then obviously they're being good overseers. There's the criticism that uh, staffers rotate back and forth between the executive and legislative branches and then sometimes develop too much of a coziness. Uh, there might be some legitimacy there, but the issue also of very young people who are paid a little bit more than minimum wage to do very significant things to advise, uh, advise the members of Congress who have little time, it's uh, sometimes a, a catch-22 situation to try to have the appropriate oversight that we do need. Uh, even though we talk about oversight taking place, starting with uh, the Church and Pike Committees and then the establishment of the Select Committees in 76 and 77, there was quasi-oversight since uh, the National Security Act of 47, however that's termed often benign neglect. In fact, a, a recent book, I forgot the author already that talked about oversight between Truman, the periods of uh, Truman through Kennedy, talked about that to some degree, but it nowhere compares to the oversight we've had since uh, uh, the mid-70s. Well, one of the authors who's done the best study on that is sitting in our audience today, Locke Johnson. The other is Frank Smith. I that's think you're thinking right. of Frank yeah. Smith's book. That's right. No, it's a more recent one. I A couple of thoughts uh, regarding the, the first presentation there. Maybe it goes without saying, but when I was learning this many years ago, I was very curious how it is that uh, William F. Buckley, the chief of station in Beirut, as I recall, was also writing for the National Review. <laughs> and I was getting a little confused. Lest there be any confusion, there are two prominent uh, William F. Buckleys who have relationships there. And, uh, yeah, were. Yeah, one of them, as is, is Larry talked about yesterday, uh, is in the past tense. Um, but uh, the issue of, of patriotism also, and it kind of relates to the issue of, of trust I mentioned yesterday and loyalty. And, uh, and, and particularly in this country where uh, we all have lots of heritage from all over the place. I think in my own heritage, having a Danish name with a lot of English roots and Welsh roots, you know, from places that have 97 letters and no vowels. Uh, also have Canadian heritage from my mother who was from southern Alberta. But you think of the term of, of patriotism, loyalty, that, that current leadership recognizes that, uh, that there needs to be a, an, an appreciation that loyalty can take place by those who have foreign language abilities but are first generation, in this case Americans, uh, if we think about those who developed the atomic bomb during World War II, were primarily Germans helping the Americans. Uh, you know, this issue of patriotism is, is a, a very significant issue that needs to be explored. And lastly, the, the moral dilemmas that have existed in the past and continue to exist uh, today, uh, IRTPA uh, did recognize that there is this paradox there. How do we protect civil liberties? 
but yet acquire the kind of information that we need to acquire. Uh, the law mandated there will be a civil, civil liberties protection officer. Uh, we're still trying to figure out where the appropriate balance is, but I think for a long time to come, there will be moral dilemmas to deal with. Good. In the interest of time, I'd like to hear what the audience questions might be. Just very briefly, to in response to some of the questions. First, um, Ted's wondering whether there is such a thing as, well, let's call it a left-wing spy hero. I mean, of course there are. Um, there's a long tradition uh, that goes back to Eric Ambler and Graham Greene in the 1930s, uh, John le Carre, of course, um, in the 1960s and on in his long, brilliant career. And on the American side, um, uh, certainly Charles McCary and probably others that I can't think, I, I can't think of at the moment. But there was a whole um, tradition there that, that um, to the extent that, that Hunt and, and Buckley were trafficking with the invention of something based on tradition, that they, they might have drawn on if they decided to do so, but, but uh, didn't have the political inclination to do so. But certainly it, it exists. And I think part of the tension of the spy novel is the the kind of interweaving of um, tendencies to write from, if you like, a right-wing political perspective and a left-wing political perspective. And that's what gives um, uh, the spy fiction genre, from my perspective, some, some capacity, in fact, to traffic in political messaging. That's what makes it interesting. So um, I'm not sure I have a whole lot to say about the, the other comments, except to say that from a Canadian perspective, look, um, I'm a great admirer of the 9-11 Commission report. Our former uh, Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau used to talk uh, disparagingly about Canadians during the Watergate era, saying all Canadians have Watergate envy. He was concerned about various kinds of inquiries that were pressing on his government about uh, the illegal operations of our RCMP security service at the time. Tried to uh, my, uh, I won't um, get involved in the, in the question of um, uh, the recommendations that came out of the 9-11 Commission report, but um, I think it's important to, to welcome that kind of, of terrific and detailed insight into not only what happened, but the ways in which we can analyze what happened, and, and I am envious uh, from a Canadian perspective that you have been able to do that in this country, and we certainly in Canada uh, have not. And just a second what Mark has to say, that, that, that part of what um, gives uh, necessity to the realm of real-world intelligence gathering and spice to the fictional world is that it is shot full with moral dilemmas, for sure. Thanks. I'll, I'll, I'll put an asterisk on that uh, disclaimer from the, uh, the Canadians not having Yes, it's on. Awesome. Okay. Uh, not writing uh, uh, a good report. I think the c report on the Arar Commission is quite an extraordinary report, <coughs> Wesley. I really do. I think the seems to me that Mr. Justice O'Connor there has uh, walked a very fine line between uh, uh, laying blame where it had to be laid, but at the same time not throwing the baby out with the bathwater and recognizing that the Canadian service and the American service are going to have to work closely together forever, and this, is, this, was, this had a chilling effect. Yeah. No, I, so I think you're being well, a little okay. modest. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't have any con I, I appreciate the comments on my presentation. Uh, I, think, I think Larry and I actually agree on much. It may seem like we don't, but uh, we both lament some of the developments in congressional oversight. Um, I perhaps celebrate the quality of the uh, earlier committees more than he would, and uh, and when someone was at you, Larry, that said uh, the Intelligence Committee staff seemed to not be as smart as they used to be, that's because Ted and I left. <laughs> there, there's no question to that. <laughs> I did want to say, uh, Wes, that uh, I don't mean to disparage the 9-11 Commission report. I think that the hearings themselves and the book that came out, the 9-11 report, is absolutely priceless and, and so beautifully written, well written, until it gets to that last section where it starts to make the recommendations. I think it really falls apart there, and I think it falls apart largely because of the undue effect of the survivors' families uh, in American public opinion that period of time. Stan? Well, uh, any Stan, comments from... Can, I, can me, I make one more comment? So somebody, the people don't think I'm completely off the edge of the world, I guess. If you look at the recommendations that are in the 9-11 Commission report, if you want to go back and read, and I could send you a list if you'd like it. I have them very well cataloged. 
of the, I think it's 27 commissions that were held on the Central Intelligence Agency and the Intelligence Service from 1948, one year after it was established, right up to the 9-11 Commission and including the WMD Commission. The one thing that was interesting in the 9-11 Commission is you will find no recommendations in that report that are new, uh, that had not been discussed, that had not been looked at by one of the previous commissions. Literally what they did was went back and went through all those commissions and did nothing but bring a whole conglomerate of, re of recommendations up out of those commissions, mixed them and mashed them, rewrote some of them, gutted some of them, enhanced some of them, and that's what ended up coming out of that report, plain and simple. 